It seems to me that ultimately all markets are contestable. The lag time depends upon the cost of entry and most often that is dictated to by the level of rigidity that's been imposed by government. That's the first point. Second point is who is it that we are seeking to serve in this? I was in China at the end of last year and had dinner with the Minister for Information who was saying to me that they were merging their three freight forwarding uh, companies. And I said, aren't you concerned this might impose some sort of competitive uh, restriction within, within China? He said, we're not worried about uh, competition within China. We're concerned about competing with FedEx, TNT and uh, DHL. So that to me raises the question about uh, just what we have in mind <coughs> when we impose uh, anti-merger restrictions. I mean, my, I have a view that in 1999 when the ACCC rejected the ASX-SFE merger, they essentially condemned the, the ASX the two, to a relatively minor role in a global sense. And so I think we, it, it, and it's very hard for people in the position of ACCC commissioners to really have all of the information available to be able to comprehend what, uh, what the dynamics are. And so as a consequence, uh, you have to ask the question, are you the best placed people to be able to play God in those situations? Well, just to pick up the last point first, Morris, the only answer to that is, um, uh, I mean, I, I can't imagine anybody else is better placed. So the only response to that is, uh, um, uh, going back to my comment where I was deliberately verbaling Greg, or maybe wasn't, uh, uh, that, that you know you don't have a merger assessment process, and that therefore the ACCC's role is uh, is pretty well. There's really no reason for it to be there. And look, I, I uh, happily accept that's a that's a point of view. Um, my guess is it wouldn't be a point of view accepted by 99% of Australians, but that doesn't make that doesn't mean that you. This isn't a democracy. It's a logical argument that that doesn't outvote you. But I, I, I mean, we spend a, a lot of time getting on top of these industries. I would argue we end up knowing them pretty well. That's why some of these merger processes take a bit of time. Uh, we don't have industry specialists. That's true because we're too small to have industry specialists. We're dealing with. Uh, mergers in different sectors all the time so we can't do that but going back to the points as you made them all markets are contestable well yes and no I mean we we fundamentally look at whether what the barriers to entry are in a market now you know if Coles were to take over Woolworths um, which seriously is is something that uh, if I take what you said to its logical conclusion you'd be quite comfortable with well, they, they may well, but the barrier to entry is that they have supermarkets placed in uh, most of the shopping centres. It's not easy for some. And the biggest complaint that Eldi has, who's the main up-and-coming competitor, is they cannot get land to build their shopping centres. So now they are getting it. Um, uh, but there is that barrier to entry in terms of access to land. Uh, there is that barrier to entry that they'd then have 75% of the market. That would allow them to enter into deals with suppliers that others couldn't, and that would um, uh, allow them an advantageous position that would be hard to challenge. So, look, I think we're you know, ha happy to debate that. I would argue that would be a, a very anti-competitive thing to happen, but others could take a different view. But it does all come down to basic economic concepts, these merger analysis. I mean, it's the, 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 the tools we're using are really simple. They're uh, how high are the barriers to entry? And of course, this has a lot to do with whether it's a traded good or a non-traded good. So going in a sense to your second point, um, which one can hear a little bit in terms of a national champion's argument sometime, um, it depends whether it's a traded good sector or a non-traded good sector. I mean, we've allowed, as I was again explaining down here, in the packaging sector, we allowed three players to go to two in one market and two players to go to one in another basically because they were subject to import competition and because uh, uh, the pl people they were selling to were big players who at the end of the day could, could sort out their own needs. So we felt that there was sufficient countervailing power. So in each case, it's a, we weigh up the, uh, the facts. Um, I don't think we oppose a lot of mergers, but the fact that we're there, yes, that does stop Coles buying Woolworths, that does stop Origin buying AGL. So I actually think it is a a valuable role but 
You know, like every part of our act, there's this lovely spectrum of opinion, which is what makes it so much fun. You've got that microphone behind you. Does the ACCC have any jurisdictional powers where um, it can be clearly shown that regulation is acting as an anti-competitive force, uh, selectively advantaging or disadvantaging certain businesses or sectors in uh, the economy? Uh, no, we don't. Uh, we, we don't have a what's known in the trade as an advocacy role. That's, um, uh, if you remember when we had the national competition policy reforms, uh, that job was passed to the National Competition Council. Um, uh, it was extremely unfortunate in my view that that whole process was shut down, although I accepted it, it had run for a fair time and everything's got to come to a, the end of its life. But these days it's, it's very much the, the Productivity Commission who, who does those things, although of course it, only gets, it can only comment on what it gets asked to, to comment on. Um, so the, the broad answer is no. What we do do though is, and what I've said publicly, again somewhat controversially because there are people who don't like me doing this, but I've said where, where we have particular insights uh, on policy questions, then we will make our views known. Um, so there's been a number of examples about that, uh, on, on that. I'm trying to think of one that fits your heading, I probably can't, but we were certainly lobbying to get the rules changed under which uh, um, energy network companies were regulated. It wasn't so much that it was anti-competitive, it was just driving up electricity prices unnecessarily. So there's been a range of areas where we will talk if we think we've got insights others can't get. Because I think to some extent, we, in, in doing all the work we do, we do get an understanding that Treasury can't get, ministers can't get, and yes, we could just quietly say those to government, but I think where there are issues that are close to us, we should make our views publicly known, but it's a very controversial topic. So the short answer is no, we don't have that role. Rod, I've got a lot of sympathy with your proposal to put it all on the back of an envelope, maybe a, an A4 envelope. But the opposition, opposition spokesmen have said they're going to have a root and branch review of the Act. And um, the man who, uh, well, Justice, former Just High Court Justice Dyson Hayden gave what could be viewed as a campaign speech a couple of weeks ago at a conference to uh, chair that review in which he referred to the Act as, a, as legislation in competition with itself. Do you or does the Commission have a view on the way in which the extent to which the Act does need to be reviewed and amended? Look, there's two elements to that. Uh, I've only heard bits of Dyson Hayden's speech. I've actually got it there to, to read as part of the weekend reading. I say weekend reading because I have a view that if you don't read things now, you never will, so you don't have little piles there. You so I'll read it this weekend, but I haven't read it yet. Um, but I think what he was getting at, on the bits I heard anyway, was that, uh, as I say, there's two parts to this. The bit I think he was getting at is that the act is very complex. So uh, when I was describing its simplicity, I more meant the sort of things that he's trying to outlaw is simple. It's not an intrusive act in terms of our ability to control prices or deal with a wide range of behaviour. But the provisions in the Act, of course, the way they're described, the Australian Act is much more prescriptive than it is overseas. Uh, in a number of overseas jurisdictions, as uh, Michael knows uh, way, way better than I do, uh, the law is just a, a sort of a one-line bit of law has been then interpreted by the courts and it's evolved to a position where people know it because of how it's evolved by the courts. Ours um, has got lovely clauses in it, uh, you know, clause 44, WZ, part three, four, I can't remember, but there's, there's things, they really do, the combination of, 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 um, of numbers and letters of the alphabet can be four or five long, um, which you've only got to look at it to say that's ridiculous. So, there's, so I thought his point was more clean it up and simplify it, and he was more lauding the act when it came into being, uh, when it probably could have fitted on a A4, tightly written, I suspect, but a uh, piece of paper. So there's that, uh, which is, which is, uh, and sorry, the second issue is, do you actually think the law should change, uh, you know, in quite a discreet way to, to achieve certain things? Um, look, on the first issue about simplifying the Act, 
it's just hard. You know, it's like the Tax Act. People say, why don't you simplify the Act? Well, you know, yes, if you were starting again with the Tax... I mean, of course, the Tax Act, I don't know how big it is now, but I've been watching this debate for a long time, and, you know, it's... Of course, it, you know, by any standards, you can only say it's ridiculous. But how do you actually fix it? Do you just throw it over and write it again? Now, that, well, look, uh, it, it probably would, but, but keep in mind the uncertainty that would then create for companies because it, you know, it, it's, it, it's partly there to close off certain loopholes, uh, whether you think they're loopholes or not is a, a matter of definition, but, um, and those loopholes I quite accept are probably brought in by some government intervention anyway, but to clean it up is just easier said than done. You know, once you've gone down the road and you've got here, you never wanted to be there, but it's not easy to go back and start again. So, I, and I'm not a lawyer, I'm not expert enough at the Act to know, to really understand, I mean, you're probably better qualified, you, you are definitely better qualified than I am, Michael, to, to say whether, no, I'm quite seriously, I mean, you need to have a deep legal un appreciation of the Act to know whether that's possible or not possible. All I know from a general public policy sense, when people have said simplify an Act, it's very difficult uh, because people want to do so much with it. Um, if I can prattle on a bit, it's a bit like government expenditure. Everybody in this room knows how to reduce government expenditure. Everybody in the room has a whole lot of government expenditure we would do without. I know I've got my list, you know, building submarines here when you could buy them overseas at a third of the price. You know, I could, I could entertain you all afternoon. But it might not be everybody else's list. It might not actually get, you know, universal support. So, so that's the trouble. When you try and simplify it, you're going to have people coming out of the woodwork saying, no, no, I want that in, I want that in. The second issue about do we think there should be changes to the Act sort of from a policy point of view, Michael, look, we've got some ideas. Um, I'm not going to mention them now because I think if we do have policy ideas, they should either come up in the context of an investigation that we're doing or, um, in a sense, we're invited to do so. So with the Root and Branch Review, we're looking forward to putting in a submission. And I'm sure you're looking forward to reading it. Thanks. Rod, I'd be interested in <coughs> whether or not you have any views on, on what I see as an impending um, global competition between competition regulators. Um, I, I'm thinking of um, the recent merger between Extrata and Glencore mm -hmm. um, was ticked off by every competition regulator in the world. Yes. Um, until it got to China. And the Chinese competition regulator said you can go ahead and do your merger, but it then told these two Swiss companies that the condition for approval by the Chinese regulator was that they divest two Peruvian copper mines, and that if they didn't divest the two Peruvian copper mines to the Chinese regulator's satisfaction, the Chinese would do it for them. And it seems to me you could have, I mean, not even the Americans would exercise that kind of extraterritorial clout, I don't think. But it, it does set up, I think, the possibility for quite, where, where you've got so many global mergers, mm. um, you could see competition regulators playing games with each other or with transactions for national sure. interest purposes. Is there, you know, is there any global organisation, is there any way of, of trying to modify what seems to me a sort of potential regulatory arms race? Well, look, a uh, couple of comments. It clearly is a problem if you've got a worldwide merger. There's now competition regulators in about 110 countries. And so if it's a merger of uh, two global players, then you've got a lot of hurdles to jump. Uh, I'd say a couple of things, though. We're, we're trying amongst the international competition regulators to harmonise the processes as best we can. But um, you know, there's only so far you can go because they're all sovereign, sovereign governments. In terms of the competition regulators, look, I, I'm of course completely biased, but I, I just don't think they're, they try and do what you're concerned about. I mean, look, I, I'm not talking about China or uh, individual regulators, but you know, we've had a number of um, mergers, international mergers, where o overseas rec competition regulators have stopped them or impeded them in some way. 
We never see that as competition. If we think locally it's not a problem, then we let it go ahead. I think we had the, um, there was a pharmaceutical one. Uh, no, it wasn't pharmaceuticals. It was, um, look, I've forgotten. I won't, uh, I'll muck it up if I go. But there was a, you know, a recent merger where we, we, we let it go through with quite modest change because of issues to do with the Australian market. And I remember talking to some of my colleagues overseas who were taking a much more heavy handed approach and I explained our approach. But I, I don't think, you know, it's not as if the world's watching us. It's just a, a the international competition regulators who, who know each other's existence. And they, they really are a fairly free market bunch of people you might be surprised to hear. So I don't think much of that goes on. But look, I it's a, it's a problem. If you're, if you're trying to get a global merger through and you've got to get it through 10 different competition regulatory agencies, try as we hard, hard as we may to, to get them to have the common processes, they're not common and it's really difficult. So I, I do have sympathy with global, global mergers. But, you know, they're usually big companies. They can usually afford the, the local representatives. And so, you know, there's worse things in life. And it's good business for my colleagues down here. I often, I often hear it said that um, Australia, or the Australian consumer at least, suffers from Australia having too many oligopolies, whether it be in supermarkets or banking or airlines or whatever. Do you have a view on that? And uh, if it is the case, uh, why is it the case? Uh, and what could be done about it? Um, look, I'm probably going to um, head a little bit in Morris's direction here, uh, if I can th rudely put it this way, with Morris over there and Bob Catter over there. Um, the um, so look, do we have a, a lot? We have more concentrated sectors than 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 the, the countries to which we normally compare ourselves to. That that's true. Why does it happen? Look, partly these things are history, but I think that the dominant factor is this is a small market. Uh, and even though we're 23 million people now, I've been around long enough, I mean, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're growing and other countries haven't, so we've for a long time been a very small market. And of course, we're a segregated market. You know, you go to the UK, and we all know it could fit into Victoria, uh, and there's 55 million people or whatever. You know, we've got basically city-states in many ways. So the market is really fragmented and so there's a natural economy of scale which applies. So I think that's the, that's the core driver. What to do about it? Um, I'm not sure you can do anything about it apart from have the laws that we've got. Um, uh, I mentioned Bob Catter. He uh, uh, is a person actually with uh, you know, deeply held views. Uh, the good thing about Bob Catter, he really you know, he has a deep belief in what he's talking, what he's saying, but he believes we should have divestiture powers in the ACCC. Now, the UK's got divestiture powers uh, that where the Competition Commission can just do an inquiry and uh, suggest divestiture. The US has got it if someone's found to have breached the Act. We don't have those powers, in my view, nor should we. I just think it's such a one-zero power. I mean, I don't like regulators having a power which is so big it's too hard to use everybody's going to call on you to use it every time every day of the week um, so it's not really a position I, I want to be in so I think all we can do is uh, I mean we obviously spend more time focusing on the concentrated sectors for our consumer enforcement and our competition enforcement and we're very wary to make sure that mergers don't substantially lessen competition so I'm not sure there's much more we can do about it than that. Um, I'm interested in your view in the increasing role that people are trying to use regulation for protectionist purposes, including things like parallel importing, but um, most recently in this case, uh, supermarket regulation, the attempt to protect Australian farmers through competition regulation. Is that something that you see as a problem or, or is it something that you take into account when doing determinations of that sort? Um. Look, just quickly, given the time, uh, three, three, I mean, the, the, I'm not sure there's an increasing role in protection. We, we're again having that discussion at, at our table. 
I mean, keep in mind, it wasn't that long ago we had very high tariffs. We had, uh, uh, you know, vertically integrated monopolies providing every utility under the sun. We had anti-competitive legislation which got unwound with the national competition policy reform. So I don't accept that, it, that, that I mean, companies are always jockeying for advantage. That's what they do. Um, I don't think it's getting worse. But look, I, I accept that, you know, you've got issues where the courts, I mean, there's been recent court judgments that make parallel importing a little harder. And that's something that perhaps the policymakers need to look at. So there's a need for you know constant vigilance to make sure these things aren't happening. I guess the more substantive question is 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 the position of farmers and and uh, uh, you know the suppliers generally to supermarkets. Where we're looking at a couple of examples of behaviour there. So we're we're using the act. Um, there's a, a, a horticulture code which is meant to protect the farmers, but it's fundamentally flawed because it's got a grandfathering clause, which means it's not usable. Whereas I think if that was removed, it could actually help farmers. Um, and the supermarkets, through their own initiative, I hasten to add, have talked about a code to guide their relationship with their suppliers. That's their initiative. Uh, it wasn't something we invented, but on balance, I think there's probably some advantage in, in doing that as well. So I think where you've got concentrated sectors, because there's a lot of industries at the moment that are selling 80% of their produce to the supermarkets. They've got a lot of power. I don't have a problem with, I mean, it's a very much an unbalanced view, but I can see a logic to having some rules around that through these, uh, these sort of codes. But again, you know, the, the, the question shows these are, shows these are, these are difficult arguments. Uh, you know, some would say that's too much regulation. Some would say I desperately need that to survive. Um, their fine judgments, which is why on balance we came down in favour of the supermarket code, provided it's effective. That was our main point with the horticulture code very much in mind. You, you had a complaint from farmers, which I think was legitimate. Uh, I won't waste people's time explaining what that was, but they had a legitimate complaint. The government responded with a code and it's totally ineffective. So it's not, not good to have regulations which are ineffective. Have them or don't have them, but don't have ineffective ones. I don't like this talk all the time about Coles taking over Woolworths. I'm from I'm from Woolworths, by the way. Um, I just okay, wonder, I'll put it wonder the other way how around. you m can decipher when people who are inefficient and don't face up to it, but fall to you as the excuse for their inefficiency by saying, "Why don't you do something about the competition?" And the farmers are a good case in point. I mean, I've been on the Fonterra board for seven years and my colleagues can't believe that people try to grow milk in Queensland. But they seem to believe that they should be guaranteed a living at whatever it costs them to make it. Hmm. And in my past, I've seen thousands of employees in uh, appliances disappear, the car industry's gone, hmm. everybody says that's competition and we all drive a foreign car. Hmm. What's special about some of these other inefficient manufacturers that affords them special protection. And that's what the public seems to uh, be demanding. And and they use you. They use you. I mean, the Coca-Cola went to the front page of the newspapers a few weeks ago to say, you should regulate the supermarkets. They've got too much power. This is someone with way bigger market share in soft drinks than the supermarkets have got because he couldn't compete with some of the tinned fruit products. And I, I, it's just very frustrating to see the, the competition used as, as an excuse for facing up to their own investment necessities and their own efficiency requirements, like all the rest of manufacturing around the world has to do. We used to make black and white TVs. We made hundreds of things that have gone because we couldn't compete. Sure. So. Look, I, I think all that... I mean, every industry uh, wants to be protected. I mean, I don't think the, this inefficiency argument uh, uh, applies any more to... Uh, I mean, of course, you've got small farmers. It, it's a sector that's, uh, uh, that, that is a good illustration of that. Um, but you've got a lot of sectors that, that seek protection from government. I was mentioning before, you know, when one of your supermarkets goes into a town where you're not there, the local players complain. Um, we try and explain the act as best we can. Uh, we're probably out there doing more more of that than you guys are. I don't know. You might challenge that, but we are out there trying to make to explain to people what the laws are and shouldn't be. But the idea that inefficient players who are facing uh, problems will complain to government that that that's not new. Uh, so it's not just the um, 
you know, it's not just the people who supply to you who want us to do things. It's, it's a whole lot of industries who want us to do things. I think the best response we can do is enforce the Act as best we can uh, to show people that actually the Act can deal with certain types of behaviour and explain where there's behaviour that we shouldn't actually be dealing with. And so, believe it or not, we are trying to do that. Uh, I mean, when the main issue came with suppliers, it was not it, it was as much an argument about unilateral changes to contracts that, as you know very well, that's what we're looking at. Um, and that's a different issue. But I think we need to be seen to enforce what we have as the best a best way of making sure we don't get laws we shouldn't have. But I don't think it's, as I say, I don't think it's unique to your industry that you happen to be uh, uh, very much uh, in the sights of the public, but uh, there's a lot of sectors that will run to government or run to us to get protection when they're facing difficult circumstances. Yeah. Oh, and, and uh, as I say, I, I have, uh, I'm sure you're hearing more of what I say over here than uh, what I say over there, but I mean, we're out there explaining what the Act should and shouldn't do. I've even gone on to Alan Jones to explain that. Uh, I didn't do very well. Um, uh, but, but we are out there trying to do that, but there are legitimate things we think we should be looking at, and so we are, and I think when we do look at those things, that does give people faith that there, is, there are some rules. Greg. Thanks very much, Rod. Uh, to to come into uh, into the CIS and start your, and end your main part of your speech with two good quotes from Adam Smith is uh, a very positive step. I think we've had a terrific explanation of of what the AACC can and can't do, and uh, I certainly learned a lot. Um, the uh, and and of course functions like this and and uh, even going on Alan Jones and other and other public uh, affairs programs and so forth will help perhaps tune up the people's the public's mind as well as your own mind as to the the limits and the uh, and so forth just on just on country towns and supermarkets we spend a lot of time in a little town north of sydney which has had a mon monopoly two supermarkets owned by the same family and Woolworths has come in and broken the monopoly so <laughs> and uh, everyone is absolutely delighted so, so yeah so uh, it hasn't opened yet, but uh, they're also having a petrol station that stays open until 10 o'clock at night. When you're driving up from here and you get there at 9 and you've got to get your petrol, yeah, anyway. So thanks. <laughs> so look, uh, thanks very much for spending the time here, Rod. It was a terrific uh, presentation, and I think everyone, as I say, I think learned a lot and gained from uh, hearing what you had to say. So uh, please join with me in thanking Rod. Thank you.